So I decided that for my little segment I wanted to do and a little offshoot that uh, I wanted to complete, I wanted to talk to a couple of my friends who are, you know, millennials in the workforce and people I know who've gotten into the business, just in life in general. And I came, the first person I, I thought of to do was my great friend, Dylan, Dylan Fashball. And he now owns his own company called Smooth Technology based out of New York City. And it is probably the wildest story I've ever seen. It's about a guy who basically basically was, I mean, essentially homeless in New York City to owning his own company and working with Lady Gaga and Katy Perry and things of the like. And it's a great story that, um, you know, I kind of wanted to go down the original path and, you know, get see what it was like millennials getting jobs and everything. But his was kind of a storied way around that and kind of how he broke the norm. But we also did touch upon, you know, what it is like for, you know, millennials to try to get jobs right now. And what are your thoughts about that? What was, I want to see what your experience was like has been so far. Before we get into the huge thing with Dylan, the huge story, just give me a brief synopsis of what you think it's like. And maybe we can compare that to see what, you know what Dylan's doing. Well, first of all, I got to say, I'm excited to hear about your interview with Dylan because, listen, you had me at Lady Gaga, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that sold me. But, um, too, you know, when I think of today's, you know, youngins <laughs> as part of being that youngins, when it comes to jobs, you know, I think the big thing is, you know, how do you find a job that pays well? I think that's a mm-hmm. huge struggle for a lot of young people is that they find jobs that, you know, hey, you have to have a master's degree, but it's $10 an hour. Or, hey, right. you know... This is a full time opportunity, but it's 30K a year. You know, it really makes you think like, okay, sometimes you have to think about part time jobs. And I think we're definitely in a part time job economy, you know, where there's a ton of part time jobs and you kind of have to stack a few of them together. I know a lot of people in my age range who they don't have a full time, but they do have four or five part time jobs. And even me as an individual, I have my full time, but then I have five part time jobs, you know, and some of those part time jobs literally happen once, twice, three times a month, right? But, um, you know, it's still income that, you know, you kind of need to make things even. So and we've all been there. I've worked seven days a week before. Oh, I, mean, I, I still almost work seven days years, a week. Yeah. Years on end. I worked seven days straight, multiple jobs. Mm-hmm. And so I think, you know, there's like this, definitely I think a lot of older people think of it like, oh, it's so easy. Go out there and get a job. But the truth of it is that there's not a lot of full time jobs, you know, because employers right. don't want to pay health care, which is an a, Another story, but another reason why healthcare should be, you know, public, you know, go go through a government system. You know, a lot of employers, they don't want to pay vacation. They don't want to pay these benefits. They make sure they hire people. OK, you can do 30 hours a week and still be considered a part time employee. So, right. you know, and some might say, well, that's a good thing. Some might say that's a bad thing. To me, it's like if you're working 40 hours a week, you should be able to be fine. No matter what 40 hours you do, I believe if you work 40 a week, you should not have to stress about living in this country. But the truth is there's people who have to work 70, 80 hours a week to support themselves and maybe their families, and it barely cuts even. You know, It's hard to save up money. Right. So that's kind of my takes. I think uh, you know, you look at you know, how pay is stalled, the minimum wage is stalled. I mean, these are more sociological takes on the issue, but uh, I'm curious to hear who you talk to about their journeys because no two journeys are the same. You know, When I graduated in 2016, I was not sure if I wanted to work in media. Um, and I had to work part-time for two years before I got a full-time job in media. So that's not for everybody. There's some people who graduate college and have to get some kind of full-time job, right? They have to kind of have it figured out. I was lucky that I could, for a few years, balance on part-time jobs. So, Yeah, you're going to love this for sure. And just to hear a story from going, you know, from beginning to end and where it is now. And by the way, this is going to be the first of a couple I'm doing. So this is the first person I've talked to. It ended up being an extremely long interview because, well, I just honestly kept having questions upon questions upon questions. So Dylan is going to be the first of a couple people I'm going to talk to, but I think you're going to like a story. So let's just get right into it. And here we go. Hello, this is Paul Lauf with Thoughts of the Roundtable. And as we said, Matt and I are doing our own little pieces, and this is going to be mine. And I've decided that I kind of want to talk to a couple millennials I know, and um, which is, I think, what is it, Dylan? From her first guess, is it 80, was it 85 to 94, something like that? Something like that. I'm 91. So Okay, I am 1990, so we're yes. smack dab in the middle of it. But yeah, so this series for me is going to be about the millennials in the workforce, how they got to where they're at. Um, what the job search was like, what they think about past job searches, and just everything in between the stories from good and bad. And as I said earlier, the first guest I have is my good friend Dylan 
Fashball. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Hello. Good. All of those things to you as well, Paul. <laughs> and uh, a little, a little um, behind the scenes here, and full disclosures that Dylan and I were actually in a band at one point. Hell yeah. Uh, the official seals, which is still, you know, I still get uh, notifications that we need to update our info on Facebook. <laughs> so, um, so maybe we need to do that. But the, the, the you're the, literally the first person I wanted to talk to, and the first person I thought of when I came up with this project of, you know, talking to millennials and how they got to where um, they're at in the world. Because you have probably one of the most ridiculous stories that you know <laughs> I can think of off the top of my top of my head and so um go ahead and explain kind of what you do and then we'll kind of roll on from there yeah so um i i have a very strange business that i own where uh a huge amount of what i do is making light up costumes for pop stars and also making kind of these strange like experiential entertainment uh i don't i don't even know how to describe like environments it's like a lot of um a lot of what i do is like making just making crazy uh live experiences for people on stage and off stage and uh so basically yeah. oh, go ahead i'm saying i've managed to work with a lot of a lot of big brands and also most of the major um pop divas out there as well i mean it's crazy to think of like i, I think you're the only friend i have and the only people around our age i know that actually owns their own business so congratulations to that because I, I literally think you're the only one i can i know of that has started their own business from scratch but I got to know, like, when you were in high school and from what I knew from you in college, yeah. you had never really mentioned anything about this. It was like, is this what you initially wanted to do or is this something just kind of spurred out from from nowhere? Or what, how, how did you get to where you're at, like the idea of it? Yeah. So I've always been obsessed with electronics and I've always been obsessed with programming. And in college and in high school, I think you know, in high school, I started out doing a lot of um, modifying RC cars. I was really into X mods from Radio Shack. I don't know if anyone's ever played mm-hmm. with those. They're awesome. And then um, I would always modify those to go really fast. I had this one that could go 30 miles per hour. And it was ridiculous because it's too small. And so it would just flip all the time. <laughs> and uh, so so I was into that stuff. And it kind of convinced me to switch from going to school for music, which is what I was originally going to go for. Um, you were originally going to go for music? I was, yeah. I was going Like what kind of uh, what kind of music? Like education or I wanted to do jazz guitar performance. Really? <laughs> yeah. Fun fact, I I also wanted to go to school for music education and I left the school of music education because of how horrific the professor was and I went to communications instead and look where I'm at now. I'm in a basement nice. recording with you. Hell yeah. It's the best place to be, man. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah. I like, after I talked to a lot of people in the music school at Akron, and I pretty quickly decided that I didn't want to do it before I actually ended up going to college. Um, So you went to the University of Akron. Did you plan on going there because of music, or was it like, how did you pick that school? So honestly, I kind of decided to go there because it's where my friends from high school were going. You know, it was a, uh, I, I, so there's a mixture of things. That was a big part because of it. Because Akron's well known for engineering. I mean, they're a huge engineering school. Yeah. And I didn't necessarily want to do engineering at first, but then I kind of, I realized that as much as I loved music, um, engineering was like what I actually did as my hobby, like the other 50% of the time when I wasn't doing music. So, right. When I decided that I didn't want to go to music school, I decided to go for engineering school. And then Akron was actually the obvious choice at that point. Not the obvious choice for the music aspect, to be honest. So it was kind of... No, it's really not. Yeah. So it was funny. It was like I actually kind of ended up switching into a better a better environment for what I was into. So, so did you apply at Akron for the music school? Or did you already know before you even went there that you were going for engineering? I applied for music and then I applied for engineering. Before I got accepted <laughs> for music. <laughs> we know a lot of people I know, at least, who are in the music program are also extremely good in, like, the sciences and STEM programs and things like that. I am not one of them. Mm-hmm. I was horrible with that kind of stuff, which is why I, I was – when I left the – forcefully left the music program at the University of Akron, mm-hmm. I, uh, I actually was going to go for history, but then I changed and I went to uh, broadcasting school and ended up on 88.1, as you know, yeah. where I met Will, and then the whole saga continued of our 
of our band, which, by the way, we just hit our 10-year anniversary. I don't know if you know that. So we happy did. old 10-year anniversary of our band. Wow. Congratulations, us. <laughs> we need to get back so, together. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, when you're in, so now you're in engineering school. This is where you're at. What yeah. is the game plan from there on out? Do you have your own idea of a new business or your own business? Or is it, what is the, what is the idea at that point? So I've always wanted to be able to be creative in whatever I do. And I found engineering to be actually wildly creative because when you're, when you're getting to make things, um, when you're designing something from the ground up, you're, it's kind of, everything is your decision and you're, it's, it's kind of like, to me, uh, writing a program is as creative as writing a song. And, and that was actually one of the things that drew me heavily toward engineering. And I think that that drive for creativity kind of actually uh, made me more entrepreneurial. I honestly think that's, that's I didn't necessarily dis- know that I wanted to start a business until probably like um, the third year or fourth year of college. But um, So you just wanted to engineer at that point? Yeah. Some sort of engineering? I just wanted to create and design. That was really what I wanted now, what, to do. I, I, I got to backtrack a little bit. Because I want to know something, because uh, I, I I didn't even know this about you, that you originally went to Akron for, or wanted to go for music. What did your, your parents and your family think of it? Because so, I know, like, even when someone says, you know, my kid wants to go from, to music school, I can only imagine what, you know, I know what my parents said, but I don't know what, how yours reacted to that. Yeah, so my my mom is an artist, so she was actually pretty okay with it, but my dad pretty okay pretty okay with it (laughs) (laughs) my dad actually went to akron for music and he was the one that drove me away from it (laughs) so he uh is he was he really yeah yeah he went to akron for music and then he went back to school um like on gi bill and stuff for for engineering and accounting and a bunch of you know all the other things that he actually does now um even though as you know he still writes music all the time but yeah, but he, he wrote us a song. I think if I don't, if I remember correctly, he did. He wrote us, I think, three songs actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, he's he's a really good songwriter and really good musician. Musician, and I learned that um, I learned from him basically that uh, going to school for music was not the best way to get into actually playing music, and that I wanted to play music. It's true, and that's and that kind of him. He would he didn't have a problem if I had decided to go for that, but he was you know he was kind of like the most direct primary resource that i could find that told me that i probably shouldn't and should actually follow my other passion which was creating creating things engineering and to be honest that was probably a good plan because you and i obviously we played music together for a few years and man there were some dark dark times in that where i remember i mean broke we were both broke we had no idea what we were doing yeah you know people would fight us at clubs and everything so i'm kind of glad that um <laughs> i think we're still banned from the outpost of, because of you yeah if i'm not mistaken yeah you know sometimes you have to fight the promoter to get your money <laughs> but that's uh yeah it's just the way it goes sometimes <laughs> yeah. yeah so okay so now you're you're halfway through engineering school and he said that's about when you wanted to you came up with the idea for the business is that when it kind of sparked so i didn't necessarily come up with the idea for this business i'd come up with the idea that I that I wanted to design things for people so as you can see like I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to design things that light up and entertain people this like on a live stage kind of thing but I've always been obsessed with music and I've always been obsessed with video games actually and and like arcade games and so I wanted to find some way to break into that realm and and uh, I'd say that by about the third year of engineering I'd started kind of learning how to create things and i became i think pretty good at it it was it's sort of it was like my driving force through a lot of school like even like in our senior like my like senior design project that i did with uh with brian and will from our band um you know we made a brain a brain controlled guitar pedal so it's kind of like that was like a you know just kind of a one of the many weird things that we had come up with that was just kind of mixing together creativity and uh and uh engineering See, I'm not an engineer. I I don't have that kind of mind. But um, I remember sitting around you guys, you know, in in our band practice. And just I love hearing 
the engineer's brain because they would you guys would just come up with the most insane crap out of nowhere <laughs> like that it, like oh i want to make a brain you know a, a brain controlled pedal or whatever and everyone else in the room would be like what the f is that and what are you talking and then you would do it <laughs> it's just like the most ridiculous things and then you'd be like oh yeah yeah i can do that like I, I to this day it just absolutely astounds me how people how engineers specifically can just pull things out of their ass like that and just be like oh it's it's no problem at all oh man and um, it kind of reminds me of this time I was in uh, I was at Carnegie Mellon for some reason I, uh, at their art school because believe it or not I have a minor in art so I really lucked out here really uh, you know picked winners hell yeah but um, <laughs> I remember. There was this there was this group of people who this group of engineers who they were creating this video game where you could create control this person walking around a room just by brain signals. You would just literally think like I want to lift up my left arm and this thing would lift up its left arm. And they were talking about it like it was nothing. Like, oh yeah, we did this, you know, a couple of like like are you serious? Like this is the most insane thing I've ever seen and they just didn't care about it. Totally. The engineers were just that's just how they are, and it's just it's a it's amazing to me. And it also, I felt like a like an idiot most of the time hanging around you guys. But I mean, that's that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> well, we're we uh you know we always felt like idiots coming up with insane ideas, and uh you know it's uh it's just a big big idiot circle. I feel like it's, <laughs> <laughs> we're all we're all weirdos, and uh, it works out. <laughs> so, um, did you ever talk to your professors about any of this or is that pretty much just a like a relationship of this how you learn engineering this would you, or did the people at akron actually push you to do anything or was it kind of on your own yeah so i had um i had specifically i'd say two professors one that one that wasn't really my professor she was actually an advisor for for an extracurricular team that i was a part of and then another mm-hmm. professor who is my actually my advisor in computer engineering and yeah uh, and both of them really did uh they always they always liked that i would show up to to classes and and uh other events that they had with strange hardware that i had built and they (laughs) they always found that funny and interesting so they would talk to me about it and um they both they both pushed me to to actually go to grad school which i did apply for i i got into a program at columbia um but i just never i just never followed through with it because i just wanted to why not so yeah the reason i never followed through really was I had a, I had a, so I had an internship at a company um, in in Akron, Ohio, uh, called Nanotronics Imaging, with that did that made microscopes, and I kind of find my, found myself as like the fourth engineer or so at that company, and was able to, um, was able to kind of like build a build a cool foundation in the startup world with that, and they they had moved their headquarters to uh, New York City while I was interning for them, and. I found this. I found it as just kind of a neat opportunity to go and try a new city, and uh, still have a job that that I loved when I moved there. And so this is when you moved to New York City, right? Because I knew you moved to New York City, but I don't. I didn't remember how you got there. So you actually went there because of the of the job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I made which draw then drops you in. You know, obviously New York City. It's a hub for pretty much everything business. So right. I can only imagine where things sparked from there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, New York. Honestly, moving to New York was one of the scariest decisions I ever made, and it made me completely broke for a long time. <laughs> but it also <laughs> was probably one of the best decisions because I was able to to do all to network with everyone who could help me get to the place where I could actually build a business. So, what was that initial move there like? Like trying to find an apartment or things like that, or yeah, you know. And could and the funny thing is, because you're how old when you moved to New York City? Uh, twenty two. Could you do that now? You think? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. It was. So what was it? What was it like? Yeah. So my moving to New York City. It's it's the most insane thing that anyone ever does. <laughs> um, the <laughs> so I found a friend um, uh, over in Worcester, Ohio, um, Brittany, and she she and I moved out to New York City together, and um, and we both didn't really have money yet and like she had a job that she knew she was because you're have. just out of college at this point you don't really have i mean you have the internship but i mean we were all broken college yeah. so we didn't have that much getting out exactly exactly so you're really like you just you're 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 not really anywhere yet out of college you know you have to you have to build that up later 
And so, but, you know, we decided to go and move to one of the most expensive cities in the world as soon as we got out of college. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so it's, it sounds really like a really terrible idea when you put it like that. Yeah. And, you know, it, it kind of was, but it kind of wasn't at the same time. It was really strange. It was in retrospect. I feel like it was fun. But at, like when it was happening, I felt like it was pretty terrible. So like we spent like the first three months in New York actually like bumming around Airbnbs and while like okay. saving money so that we could actually um get an apartment because what they don't tell you when you move to new york is that you know well first i mean you kind of know that everything's going to be expensive but you whenever you rent an apartment you also have to pay this crazy fee for the person that found you the apartment the broker's fee and you have to pay like three months of rent up front and when and that's anywhere that's like a standard thing in new york totally city totally standard and and you have to prove that the income that your income is like 40 times the rent 40 <laughs> i'm not even kidding it's ridiculous <laughs> so that i mean new york city's uh, rent is already insane how are you going to get it prove that it's 40 times yeah and that that was the incredibly hard part we hold on so what is what what, what is a typical i got to do some math here what is a typical rent so S- say standard a, a crappy apartment is like two thousand dollars a month Okay, so two thousand dollars a month. You that means you would have to. That's eighty thousand dollars, which I did not make when I moved to New York. <laughs> <laughs> we we had to pull strings. Honestly, that was the only way. I mean, I mean, call it what it is. You were essentially homeless when you moved there. I mean, Airbnb to Airbnb. That you're you're essentially homeless at that point. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. For for several months, and then ultimately we found this. We found this little apartment in deep in Chinatown. Um, I gotta go back. That hold on yeah. one second. Like how many? How many? How long were your Airbnb stays? Would you go from like a week, or is it like a month in one? Anywhere from we spent a month in one, but usually like three days, four days. So so you would have to literally you'd have days, and then you have to find somewhere else to go. Yep. Yeah. So we were. Did you ever have any point where you didn't find anywhere to go and parking lot it or overnight? Yeah. Or? Yeah. I slept uh, at my I slept at my job a few times, um, and. We, I've done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've actually done that. I've done that uh, not even all that long ago, to be honest. But um, I don't think you've had a good career until you've had to sleep at your job. Yeah. We've all done it, right? Exactly. You kind of have to. <laughs> and I also got, I got really lucky that the, um, one, of the, one of the times when um, we just had nowhere to stay, uh, the CEO of, uh, of, of the company that I was working for actually let Brittany and I stay in his apartment for like three weeks while he was out traveling for business. So wow. we got, we got to like See, live I mean, in luxury actually for like a little bit of that. <laughs> yeah. Cause you, I mean, you essentially had to tell him like, Hey, like I'm on the streets unless you help me out. So, and I work for you. So could you like, you know, pretty much, man, that's dedication to a job. My God. Yes, it was pretty nuts, I mean, man. Seriously. It was pretty nuts. And so how do you eventually land that land? The, uh, did you enjoy it though? Did you weirdly enjoy it or was it just kind of stressful the entire time? Yeah. Cause how do you focus on your work when you're like, man, where the hell am I going to go tonight? Yeah. You know, it was weird because after like a week or two of that, you just stopped caring about where you're going to go that night. You just kind of realized that you're going to end up sleeping somewhere. <laughs> you know, you're going to fall asleep <laughs> that night. You're going to wake up in the morning. And like, I knew that there's places to shower. There's like gyms and stuff. Like you can, you can kind of figure it out. And, and it was, it was strange. Cause I feel like, you know, moving from Ohio where, you know, in Ohio it's, we have a, we, we, definitely have like you know pretty cheap rents and it's pretty easy to to find a place to sleep that kind of thing but then um when you're when you go to new york and it's not so easy you have to you kind of just end up adapting to it and realizing that anywhere you sleep is pretty much as good as anywhere else you're going to sleep so you might as well just deal with it (laughs) and that became my mentality after after a week or two did you ever like regret going out there for this or did you know that and how long did you plan to stay did you know it was going to be years that you'd be out there or no yeah i kind of i was hoping to spend like at least six years out there or maybe even just forever but eventually i grew to really dislike it but (laughs) we'll get to that but um (laughs) but yeah i mean i didn't i i kind of uh i kind of thought it was like maybe like a permanent career move at that point to be honest one of the things i hear a lot of older people say is that you know, millennials have no drive for their job or things like that. But my God, I don't, there's no way that can be true because I know what I've, I've had to do for my career yeah. in life. And I mean, just, and it's not even half of what you've, you've had to do. I mean, I've, I've had to deal with, you know, borderline you know, muggings, 
you know, in the middle of the night because oh. I had to stay at my job, you know, overnight. And just broke the entire time. Yeah. And, but I mean, I, I, that's one thing that always bothers me is when anybody says that millennials don't have drive. Oh, it's ridiculous. Or, you know, they have it easy. It's like, yeah. we probably have one of the hardest times getting it, which is why I sparked this. Because someone had actually sent, said something like to, that to me. And I was like, I know a bunch of people who are our age, who are millennials, that, and we get beat up for everything Gen Z does and, you know, and all that. But I mean, there's so many stories like you included that it's just, I mean, we work your, your butts off to get where you're at. And, it kind of is passed over, and people don't really realize how hard it can be. Yeah, yeah, I feel like, and what it's become. Because yeah. I don't know how many times I've heard people tell me, "He's like, why don't you just go and get a job? Why you just don't go and call them?" And that's a whole different thing that we can talk about later. Totally. And I think that was one of the things that drove me no- most nuts is when he says, well, "Why don't you just call them? Like that's what you can do now. You just call people up and say, <laughs> hey, I applied for your job. Can I have the job?' Like that's what the that like that's what you do nowadays, right? You know, and it it never works that way. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I feel like like people like our age, people we went to school with, are the most driven people I've ever met. It's it's not it's not like the folks who are like older than us that are complaining about millennials the whole time. I feel like like the younger people that I've met are the ones that are willing to actually go all out and figure figure out how to how to make it. I mean, we've had to do things that like you wouldn't even imagine twenty years ago to do to get to get jobs. I mean, I don't know how many times. Oh, the, one of the worst ones. I will never forget this, my man. Mm-hmm. Never forget this. Yeah. I was um, just out of broadcasting school. And before I went to grad school, I actually went, funny thing, I went to grad school and got my master's. I kid you not. I went to grad school because I couldn't afford my student loans, so I went there so I could defer them. I kid you not. That's why I went to grad school. Wow. And I, en- I ended up loving grad school. Yeah. So, you know, it, was, it turned out okay. But that's... I mean, my family told me, it's like, hey, you know, if you go to grad school, you can defer your student loans. It's like, good, I can't afford them. <laughs> and so, so that's, you know. It's amazing. I lost my train of thought. Where was it? Where was I going? But um, it's just, so I ended up, you know, oh, the the interview. Yeah. <laughs> God. So I was, out of, I was before grad school and I was trying to find a job. And um, people, I don't think people realize, you know, older people realize how sketchy some of these things can be. Oh, yeah. And how terrifying they can be. And I applied for this job that was like, it was a communications manager at some company. And it looked real cool online and everything. So I was like, cool. So I applied online and I got a call like an hour later, which should have, looking back, it should have been my first like red flag. Like that something was like not, not right, you yeah. know? And so, <laughs> which is funny because, you know, it's you get a call back, but then there's something weird about that. But so I show up to this place and I think it was, Oh God, I forget. I think it was like North Ridgeville or something, Ohio. Mm-hmm. And it's in this strip mall, this address he gave me, this strip mall. And this guy called me and says, you know, whatever. And I walk in and this place is like, it's like kind of like an office building, but it's not done. Like all the, it's like clearly under renovations. It's all under renovations. Like the carpet's torn up, drywall's off in some areas. There's lights hanging, you know, oh from God. wires and stuff. And the only room that was, done and finished was this guy's office it was like a glass office <laughs> and so i walk in there i'm like man this is weird but i didn't you know i needed the job so it was whatever yeah totally and so he, he he calls me back to his to his office and i'll never forget it so i sit down in this chair and this guy was one of these guys with these slick back hair you know the tight suits and everything mm-hmm. and so i sit down in the chair and he t- shuts the door and locks it behind me Oh my god, that's horrifying, dude! <laughs> it was it was serious. I kid you not. I'll never forget the like. The, I felt my stomach drop because it was just, you know, shutting the doors, whatever. For one thing, you know, privacy. There's nobody else in there. I don't didn't even matter. Yeah, but he shut it and then like with a key, like a physical key, he went and like sh- locked it. I was like, oh my Jesus. god! And so it it turned out it was like this horrifically shady job. Like it was a pyramid scheme, basically. And so the entire, I mean, I knew I didn't, from the moment he locked the door, I was like, I just got to get out of here. Like, I don't care what I say. I don't want this job, man. I'm, it's not worth it. And so I said anything I could do to get out of it. And eventually, you know, it, it was it is. And he let me go, obviously, and nothing happened. But man, like, can you, this, this kind of crap was unheard of back in the day. But it, that that's just normal now. This is just this is what it totally. is. Totally. You're scrounging. You know, and, I've had. And you just end up in the weirdest situations. <laughs> <laughs> I've had in- interviews like that. I had one time where I interviewed at a car dealership for a position for doing like um, their w- work on their websites or whatever. Yeah. 
and uh, the lady who was interviewing me legitimately could not read. Could not read my resume. I had to read her my resume. Wow. Did she understand <laughs> what you were saying? Yeah, she. Yeah, she. It's just she just couldn't read. Wow, that's incredible. It was just, and you know, it's it is what it is. You know, I don't want to make fun of you know difficulties yeah. or anything, but it was just it threw me off guard when she told me that. I'm like, you know, it's totally. just, it was wild. Totally. But oh, um, man. Okay. Nuts. <laughs> okay, so enough of me. Back to you. So now you're in New York City with this internship. What what happens? Yeah. Then? So. Um, so at that point, that was when I moved to New York City. Was when I officially went full time. So it was right after graduation, and uh, yeah. So you know, we bounced around Airbnbs, sleeping at the office, sleeping in the car, all that kind of good stuff for the first, the first couple months, just kind of figuring it out. And then um, eventually, we found this this little apartment in Chinatown. I'm not even kidding. It's it was like 190 or like 180 square feet, um, with somehow two bedrooms and a living room. That's like a kitchen. I know. Just, just think about that. My, my bedroom was six feet by eight <laughs> feet. Brittany's bedroom was six feet by six feet. <laughs> oh um, our living room... Did it have a door in between you guys? Or was it just like, this is your corner, this is my corner? Yeah, we, we actually had a, we had walls and doors. It's like unbelievable how small... How? I, I know, right? It's They basically didn't exist. It was just like these really thin little walls with this like weird little... like They, they call this... Anyone from New York would know this. It's called a winged two bedroom. It's the worst most insane apartment design anyone could ever hear of but no i'm assuming you couldn't even fit a bed in that right you you know i had a futon and it fit almost perfectly and the the worst thing about that though is you actually couldn't move it without taking it apart and putting it back together but (laughs) you know in a weird way it kind of you know after you're living in a tiny a tiny space you kind of like end up getting used to it and sort of enjoying it but at the same time, I mean, the bad side of that apartment though was, it was, uh, it was completely full of cockroaches, and uh, was it yeah, really? and it cost like all of the money we were making at the time. But now I'm assuming like you guys, you didn't, you probably didn't have anything with you. Probably had like a bag of clothes, right? Like that was basically yeah, it. pretty much. And that was yeah, like um, I had a, I had a cot, like a like a camping cot, and mm-hmm. um we set that up like in the in like the the living room um that didn't really exist and so like sometimes uh sometimes like one of us would sleep on like the cot and i slept on like a, a towel on the ground for a little while but eventually i did oh my i did God. get a futon and that futon was actually pretty awesome and like a literal towel just <laughs> draped on the floor yeah and you know the weird thing is it's not the first time i had done that i did that in ohio too for some reason Sometimes I yeah. slept on a deflated air mattress in college. I'll never forget that. It was covered in duct tape <laughs> oh, it's amazing. and everything. It's great. <laughs> I feel like you know you have to have you have to have horrible sleeping situations. It's the it's the best way to to learn some drive, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's one of them. Yeah, yeah it kind of works out. But so you you spent years. You said I'm sorry. You said you spent basically all your money just on the uh, rent alone. So what did you do for? No food or travel or anything or is that basically just did not existent yeah it was um you know this is a weird thing you can actually eat cheap in new york no tourists will ever tell you that but if you live in chinatown you can you can actually find a lot of like really cheap food that is so much better than you'd ever expect it to be so we actually honestly like even if you only have a couple bucks like like a day or like a, a you know for for food or something you can actually totally get by it's it's a really it's really strange because when we lived when we were like um kind of jumping around different airbnbs and stuff we were we were in places where it was like harder to afford that kind of stuff but then living in chinatown kind of everything everything came together and in a weird way i feel like that's where that's where my new york experience actually started and kind of turned around it became good even though i was living in a six by eight foot room in like a part of town (laughs) that no one really ever went to like we were very deep into chinatown but it it started to work out around then. <laughs> so what happens then? Like, are, have, is, are you considering leaving the internship at this point? Or? Yeah. So at that point, um, I kind of had, I'd started, I'd really had started to, you know, get the hang of, of working this job um, in New York. And uh, my roommate was starting to get like into her thing of what she was doing. And um, because I'd, I'd been there for a while, I just kind of, uh, you know, I, d- I basically was just kind of like grinding, like at <laughs> you know at work for the first uh, the first while while there. But I also was a, was kind of starting to build like my group of friends, and I got really lucky that 
the uh, the company that I worked for was actually inside of a inside of an art building called Pioneer Works, and okay. I got to meet a lot of a lot of artists and um, and other kinds of creative types that eventually led to where my entrepreneurial journey started. So, so yeah, I kind of, I worked, I worked for a long time in that, in that environment um, and managed to actually work my way up to the position as the lead engineer of the company after basically grinding for two years. I know it was, <laughs> it's kind of like, you're just pushing really hard like every day for like two years. And then eventually um, because I was such an, I was such an early employee and managed to, I think, do some pretty pivotal stuff. I managed to actually end up being being the lead engineer, and that was where things got easy. But I have a weird tendency to not like when things are easy. So I, I have a feeling like a lot of creative people are that way. Yeah, it's it's kind of you don't necessarily just want to glide, and mm-hmm. that's what I was like in radio. Like whenever I there's a, there's a common. Uh, thing in radio where it's like if you're starting to get comfortable in your job you're starting to do something wrong. yeah and that's kind of i feel like what you're exactly doing. exactly yeah it was it was like i i'd done this grind it was hard and it was like spending spending every dollar i had and uh and um and also at that point too uh maggie my future wife had moved out and she was she was actually living in pennsylvania at the time and um and i had begun commuting from pennsylvania to new york city every day which my God, how long is that? About an hour and 45 minutes each way. Oh, it's not as long as I thought. Yeah, it was, you know, I'd spend usually like somewhere between three and a half and four hours in the car every day. It was a lot of time, but, you know, it's, it was, it that was like the glide period where before before <laughs> deciding to start a business and uh, and while just like having having this job and kind of at that at that point. I knew that like there had to be something that was next. Like I, I wouldn't just do this forever. So right. I was using that as like a as like a means to to get to a point where I could start a business. And and somehow though during that glide period, the thing that actually thrust me into it was one of those guys that I'd worked with at Pioneer Works, uh, Dave Sheinkov, got a uh, got a request to to make a light up costume for Taylor Swift. And Dave knew that I was into like wireless technology. And all kinds of electronics, all kinds of like weird, weird esoteric electronics. So he uh, he gave me a call and and asked if I wanted to uh, to work on that project. And that was so you go from just interning to also like, hey, Taylor Swift needs this thing done. Can you do it? <laughs> right, right. And I was I was full time, but yeah, it was like I was uh yeah, it was it was basically like I just kind of got this call like out of the blue that that suddenly Taylor Swift might need something that i could help with and i thought what a weird cool opportunity i'm just gonna go for it did you ever think of turning it down because of how odd it was or like no this is full bore what i want to know that's the weird part i never thought about turning it down (laughs) even though i knew like i was knew i was like there's there's no chance that there's no chance that this is going to be like lucrative it wasn't it wasn't like there's there was nothing lucrative for years at, at my own business and i knew that there was like no chance that uh like I didn't know if there'd ever be any other kind of thing that would follow it. I didn't know like how to build that exact kind of thing. I just thought I could figure it out. And and yeah. See, that's what I love about <laughs> the engineer drive is like I don't know how to do this, but I'm sure I'll figure it <laughs> right. out. Right. Like it's the most it can be the most stressful thing in the world and that's why my anxiety alone would prevent me from being an engineer. Cuz someone presents you a problem and you're like I have no idea how that can happen. I'm pretty sure it's not even possible, but I'm sure I'll figure yeah, it out. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? That's the fun part <laughs> of it. You know, it's like playing a puzzle game. You're you have all these tools that you're aware of and someone has some crazy request and you're just applying everything you've ever learned to to figure out how to how to make this thing happen and and that's kind of what that where where that came into play so it was like dave dave at pioneer Works had given me a call and then um james devito who's uh the other uh was the other early founder of smooth technology with me um he uh gave james a call and we kind of all assembled for the first time to do this this weird out of the blue taylor swift led dress project and we were also all working our day jobs at the same time. So I was still working at Nanotronics. Dave was working at Pioneer Works. James was working at a company called Adafruit. Any electronics hobbyists will know that company. And um, and uh, we at night, we were just working on, on this dress. 
and I've never been more exhausted. So you're basically life. working 24 hours a day. At this yeah, point. it was, it was crazy. Um, I've, I think, I think you told me one time about how you finished work. Correct me if I'm wrong on the story, but you, you were in Harlem or something yeah. and you, you finished at like, like three, 4 AM and had to like walk to the train station uh-huh. and said it was just like the weirdest thing you've ever oh, seen. Oh yeah. I mean, it was, it was, uh, there were a lot of, um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of drug, there were like a lot of like drug addiction issues that you could just see up there. And, uh, and so it was like, we were basically like, like wading through a bunch of uh, like basically heroin addicts that were on the street at like four in the morning who That's were all just standing crazy. there and just kind of stare at you the whole time. It's a really, a really bizarre thing. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, that was, so that was like, that was like a night on a nightly basis for quite a while, actually. So how much sleep are you getting? Basically two hours a night because you'd work at work your day job and then this at night. Yeah, I'd say I'm at most two hours. It was not healthy. <laughs> it was and it was like that for like a month and a half. Are you oh serious? yeah, it was it was bad and uh, yeah and so that kind of you know I've always been good at not sleeping, but that was like a, to a pretty extreme level. Did, was there any point at this point where you're like taking you know the subway home at the four a.m. Thinking like, what the hell am oh, I dude, doing? One, like, why am I 100%, here? One hundred percent. It was like, did you ever almost like pull the pull the ripcord at that point and say, you know, what, screw this, I'm I'm honestly, done. if I felt like that was a choice, I probably would have, but I just didn't feel like it was a choice. I was like, there's, we're like committed to this thing. It's for the 1989 world tour, like her, maybe her biggest album ever, and like it was, it was just like blowing up, and it was, I knew that that this was like such like a fundamental component to one of the songs that was kind of like the they're just you know failure failure was not an option in this situation (laughs) so you know it was like it was just like push through drink red bull at that point we were talking about uh we were talking about getting sponsored by red bull because of how much we were drinking and uh (laughs) it was like um it was just literally like every every single day um every single night uh just working and on the weekends too you know doing just doing like double time like the same amount of work pretty much and maybe trying to get another hour of sleep or two and yeah so this was this was kind of like the turning point of when you kind of started shifting towards your your business i would assume like this was kind of when it it started yeah exactly because that was i was like meeting james and dave i was like oh these are two other people who will also do this with me like like I've met other people that will actually work this absolutely insane thing that we're doing to try to make this crazy project into a reality. And I was like, this is a good thing. (laughs) Even, even though everything (laughs) sucks right now, this is a good thing. But now it had to be in the back of your head. Like you even say, I wanted to start my own company. I mean, you're an engineer, you're not an entrepreneur. So it's like, in my head, even if I want to do that, I'd be like, how the hell do I start a company? Like I would not know anything. Totally. So how do you go from like, I have this idea. This is what I want to do. I have these guys who are just insane as I am. Yeah. Like, how do you go from that to start? Like, I wouldn't even know the first thing to do. Totally. And we didn't, I, I don't know if we still do, to be honest. It's, uh, it's <laughs> like, you know, we, we came up with a, with a name. Well, James, James had this name already actually smooth technology. And then we, we were like, cool. Like that's what we'll call ourselves. And then, And then we go from that to trying to figure out like, oh, wait, how do you like make this into an entity that the government recognizes? And that's insane. That is an illegal. Yeah. Like, how do you (laughs) how do you do this? And and yeah, it's like we're we ended up like like talking to like lawyers. And that was before I knew how much lawyers cost. And then, dude, lawyers are so expensive. And so, you know, that's the job, man. That's got to be the job. I know, man. Well, white and so he's doing but yeah <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but it was like like talking to lawyers when like you're like start trying to like figure out how to you're like spending money like to like find like lawyers and like start a business like start like the legal side of the business and stuff while not having any idea what any of it means and like living out i can only savings. imagine like you going into <laughs> you can going to a lawyer's office and say, all right, I have this crazy idea. I want to do this, 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 this. I want to do this. I want to, ha- you know, work with this person. And they're probably like, how do I make this a business? And they're probably looking at you like, what the heck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know? Totally. 
Because them, like, you're confused about how to start a business, but on their end, they're like, they know how to start a business, but, like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're like... What do you mean? They're like, oh, like, you're, the clients you're going to aim for are going to be, like, these, like, five specific pop stars or like you know it's like it's like you want to it's yeah, such a weird like, can you thing. imagine walking to, it's like it's like i have one client it's taylor swift i'd be like get, get out of my face what are you talking about what your one client is taylor <laughs> right swift. like what do you mean like who who the hell starts their job their their business and their first client is taylor yeah. swift like who totally dude i don't know I, it's it was the weirdest luckiest moment ever that that job just fell in our laps to be totally honest and yeah. so so what happens then? Like, so you you eventually finish the the dress. I'm assuming. Yeah. So right? we finish it. Um, working with a designer, uh, Ash Levine. Can you at all? Can you at all see this anywhere? Uh, the can you see the dress? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's um for how you get the girl in the 1989, 1989 uh, Taylor Swift world tour. You can you can find it all over the place. It's in the it's even in the calendar. If you uh, in fact, it's September, the the official Taylor Swift calendar uh, September from like 2018 or something was the was that dress <laughs> in fact insane. the dress is right, i'm sorry the dress is in the country music hall of fame as well so that's kind of another yeah are you serious it's at the the taylor swift learning this, center this... i think is what it's called man do i feel small my god i haven't done anything with my life <laughs> dude i never expected this to actually like go anywhere it was it was a weird thing but it was really fun <laughs> but, but all yeah. right so so what happens yeah, so now? we finished the dress and then you go to rehearsals because you have to put the dress on Taylor, and you have to see if she likes it, and you have to, uh, you have to. How nervous, nerve wracking was that? Where it's like you spent literally, like basically, killed yourself making this. Almost literally killed yourself making yeah. this. How worried were that you're gonna go and she goes, this thing sucks. I'm totally worried. It's it's a thing like because you have no idea what her reaction is gonna be, and you know she's she's the boss. Like she is the boss, and there's a bunch of other people who are still your boss in that situation so it's like so it's like you have to impress the lighting designer you have to impress the the production of the like the producer of the show you have to produce you have to impress all these people and also taylor swift and that was the goal was like get all these people to say that it's good and uh and basically make it make it exactly what they want and you know put our flavor into it so that we can have this really cool piece of art on stage and and that time you know that specific moment when you're actually at rehearsals was that was the time that was literally the most exhaustive I've ever been in my life because I didn't sleep I took I took off my real job <laughs> at that time um I took like I took that off for a couple <laughs> days and we literally didn't sleep for like six days straight maybe it was I, it was straight through so work. the first time the first time you ever met taylor swift i mean anybody who's you know a fan or even if you're not a fan i mean it's taylor swift so you pr- kind of be starstruck and nervous mm-hmm. but you i assume you go over it's like i don't care like just do you like this or not like i'm so tired like <laughs> i don't care do you want it do you want yeah, it dude. is that like kind of how it and, went? you know so the the fashion designer we worked with was really the one that like presented it but i'm like standing there like vanna white presenting it like <laughs> i'm also standing there just kind of like <laughs> showing it off and you're in, I'm the, in dress. the dress <laughs> 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 i wish no but uh yeah and and you know it's really weird i thought i'd be like utterly like starstruck and like it'd be hard to talk and stuff but i've learned about myself that that doesn't actually happen to me for some reason i i kind of th- you kind of kind of yeah. put that out of your head because like i've been in radio for years so i've talked to a couple you know well-known yeah. people and you just kind of like it depends on the other person really if they make you feel like they're just another person then that's what it is totally you know? you're I'll never, one of the best conversations I ever with a celebrity was MGK, mm-hmm. and everyone was freaking out because you know it's MGK. Yeah. MGK. I'm, he, I was talking to him about the chalet and strong. Totally, Soul. like that's you know it is what it Dude, is. It's amazing, but. exactly. It's like they're all just humans, and they all just want to talk about normal stuff. In fact, if you just talk about normal stuff with them, I feel like they're more appreciative of that than you like fawning over them. <laughs> I, d- I did mess up one time because I met Sarah Bareilles and I didn't know it was Sarah Bareilles. Uh-huh. I was like, who are you? She goes, Sarah Bareilles. I was like, oh. Oh, my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, like, I literally didn't know who she was. Who are you? I, I knew the name and I knew her voice, but I hadn't seen her yeah. face. And she's like, this is Sarah Bareilles. I'm like, oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's too funny. No, man. It's true, though. So, But, yeah. So, where's it go from there? Now you're done with Taylor Swift's dress. Yeah, so we finished that up. And, you know, I go, 
well, first off, we finished that up. I get on a train back to New York City. So these rehearsals for almost all these big popbacks are in this little tiny middle of nowhere town called Lidditz, Pennsylvania, um, where there's a company there called Tate Towers, and they just they make like every stage you've ever seen in a live show. They're crazy. And mm-hmm. they have this like giant shell building that you can like house an arena stage in and practice in. And it's in basically Amish country, Pennsylvania. And yeah, it's, <laughs> it's nuts. And, and basically I'm, I board a train there to go back to New York city. And I was going to work that morning. I left, I left them at, I left them around 4am and I was planning to get to New York city to go to work around 7am and i had like that was like the the moment where i reached like level of exhaustion where i actually couldn't keep like my eyes open like at all like it was that it was yeah that you, point. you couldn't like you were, attempt to your body was literally breaking yeah it was down. just over it was like but it was like there's this feeling of relief that came with it where it was like oh all right we're actually done like this thing's gonna happen what the hell this is real and then my body was just like it's over <laughs> just shut down you're probably running on all adrenaline at that point and then when that wore yeah. off there was your body was gone there was no nothing else to run on it was em- it was gone totally empty. and man i rode that commuter train all the way to penn station in new york and i did not wake up for the from the middle of pennsylvania to the middle of penn station new york on that whole journey it was it was <laughs> insane how long of a journey is that it was about three and a half hours or so but like you know i'm sitting next people are sitting on the train like, you, you go through Philly, and people get on the train who are, like, commuting to, like, Princeton, and then people get on the train at Princeton going to New York and all this other stuff. And so you're, like, sitting next to people. People are, like, putting luggage over your head and <laughs> never, ever responded to it. <laughs> I was, like, must have looked like a corpse to those people. But, yeah. So is is it is now the point when you've decided to start the company, or is it still kind of in the background? So it was, it was getting there. At this point... I kind of, you know, I went back to like grinding at work and was like, okay, I now know that there's a thing that, that I can work on that's pretty special and, uh, and I really enjoy, even though it's like almost killed me. And I decided that, uh, I decided at that point that, you know, I was just going to, I was basically at that point working to make enough money to, to like save up enough that I could actually like quit my job and be able to um be able to focus on this thing full time and so i did i think i worked for about six more months and then i quit and then pretty much nothing came in like had no projects for like a year (laughs) Um, (laughs) so you're basically unemployed for a year in new york city what did you do for Um, money i i did like little contract odd jobs here and there um I I worked with uh I, I would try to find random companies to work with um cuz I was I was working with mostly James at that point. Um James and Dave hadn't quit their full-time jobs yet. So I was the first one I was the first one to quit. And uh yeah, I was just doing doing odd jobs everywhere I could to uh to make up for that income that I did not have. <laughs> and in a in a weird way, that was actually a really fun period of time because I got to work on the design of like all these different strange, like industrial machines and also like websites and like databases. And it was like a very, a really weird time where I actually learned a lot. I learned how to do everything because I just like, the only way to survive was to be able to do everything. So I had just had to learn everything. (laughs) And (laughs) so it was like, (laughs) I mean, you had no other choice. So it's like, did you ever take a project where they're like, can you do this? You're like, yeah, sure. But you had like no idea how to do it. Every single project. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Maybe not every (laughs) single project, but a lot of them were that way for sure. Cause you know, my, my background was like, okay, I, I had made an led dress with like wireless technology and programmed that system. And the other thing I had done was build, build microscopes. So it's a pretty weird skill set, you know, <laughs> anything else that you're doing outside of that you kind of <laughs> had to make up. So did you quit your job thinking there was work ahead or did you just kind of jump off and, and pray and then it just didn't work yeah, out? It was, it was really jump off. Um, and then it was, it was definitely like a little bit of a leap of faith. I kind of felt like I had, I had, I had my, uh, I'd like done my time at that company and I just kind of wanted to explore. So I figured I had this idea in my head where I was like, I'd saved up enough that I could live for a few months and not, not need a job for a few months. 
but I needed uh okay. but like and so if I absolutely utterly failed during those few months, I would just go figure out a way to get another job. Which, you know, is way harder than it than it actually like I was making it easy in my head and I'm thankful that I didn't do that. Didn't need to do that because I probably would have had a really hard time finding a job when I was if I told them like, Oh yeah, you know, I I like quit my good job where I had like like I was like managing people and had a a pretty good position and stuff and I just quit it kind of randomly to go and try to do something else like I, I feel like that wouldn't look very good say, what is your, a lot of companies what, what does your family think at this point it's like I quit my job don't worry I'm gonna be working at Taylor I didn't, Swift like I, I mean didn't tell that, him that's basically what yeah. happened I didn't tell you what him. I I didn't you tell didn't? him until the day I quit so you just called him up and be like hey by the way yeah pretty much it's like by the way i uh decided to take a leap of faith and uh stop everything i was doing that was actually working out <laughs> <laughs> what was their response to you that know, their response was my dad's response was kind of like was like you know i understand that you want to do kind of like creative engineering work for a living but he said he said just remember that that it's still a job and like you still do actually need to like keep hours and he's kind of like reminding me that that even though i was making myself unemployed i shouldn't i shouldn't act unemployed that's kind of like his his response to it and you know my mom i think thought i was a little bit crazy but she she respected the decision they were both they were both cool with it but i think they also realized kind of the gravity of it that it was like that i was like potentially making myself pretty unemployable <laughs> at that moment <laughs> <laughs> so so how do you eventually start getting contracts in again like what what when's the next big yeah one? so i got lucky that there was a project actually at my old company this isn't the first time you got lucky. yeah i know i got lucky a lot i, it's, I mean let's be honest i feel like entrepreneurship is like 85 percent luck well maybe not quite that high it's like 50 percent luck probably it's it's a mixture of absolutely working your ass off and then being really lucky at the same time. That's honestly what it is. <laughs> Cuz <laughs> that's that's the secret. Yeah, like formula. even even to this day like I wake up at like like usually between 9 and 10 and then I will work like a a full day until like 6 or 7 and then after my wife goes to sleep, I'll usually start working again and I'll work until like 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. and that's just like that is my daily my like daily way of being <laughs> so even on the oh, weekends yeah, i mean on the i work every weekend i'm honestly like it's i'm like pretty obsessed with what i do so i just don't ever stop to be honest if i'm like not if i'm not like actively spending time with with like other people like if we're not if we're not hanging out or like I'm not like going out to eat or something i am for sure working i'm very obsessive about this stuff <laughs> what does your wife think uh, of that i think it, it it definitely uh it annoys her sometimes because She's like, you've been in your office for like 18 hours straight and you haven't slept and <laughs> and I'm here. <laughs> but, you know, we get we get by. It definitely it's definitely a uh, it's definitely a real balance, though. Like work life balance is not my strong suit. That's something that I'm trying Clearly. to learn all the time. But I'm not good <laughs> at it. So what? Well, so what was the next big project though? Like when did the next thing really? Break yeah. So the you? next thing that, that really rolled in was, um, you know, after, after struggling for a while on that, um, we started getting these little, these little projects actually kind of, um, little, like little projects that could just kind of like help float this, uh, this kind of new company that, that, um, that we had made. And at this point, it's like the dam was, yeah, leaking. exactly. <laughs> And at this point, James had kind of James had started to go full time as well, and um, and so we we made this like crazy uh, like LED infinity mirror octagon for. Um, was it an official company at this point? We had we actually did have an LLC formed at that point, so we'd we'd begun to be a company, although we didn't know literally anything about how to run a company. We just had a name, <laughs> you know. The go the government <laughs> knew that we were called Smooth Technology. However, we didn't know what it even meant to have a company. We were we were figuring that out, and um, you know, these little jobs started rolling in. We built these like this like LED octagon. Um, we were we uh, it was weird. Like one of the one of the first jobs we had, well, we got contacted for, but ended up not happening. 
um like honestly the reason i quit my job like pretty abruptly was um the uh this is like super early this is this is actually right before the big big uh time where we didn't have any any work but we got contacted by the white house during the during like the last year of obama um to build like a a robot that would show twitter messages and we were supposed to build it with adam savage from mythbusters and and like unreal <laughs> when, that, when that project came in i was like all right i'm quitting my job and this is what i'm gonna go do for a living that was actually the thing that, that convinced me to quit my job but it turned out that the white house didn't have a budget for it and they <laughs> wouldn't even pay for the parts like they wouldn't pay for like the parts to build the thing and so i was like i literally can't afford to do this project <laughs> and it of course completely fell through and that's when that was actually when uh that was when like i was like okay well i have a company i don't have any work i quit my job and now you have to figure out the rest of this stuff but yeah after like a year of that we started to get these little projects where um we were building little lighting things for small bands got, oh yeah what's up paul i got yeah. a question though because how does the white house find a no no offense to you a small tiny ass company like you to yeah. do this I mean, you're essentially non-existent at this point. How do they come across yeah, you? Yeah, so um, they they actually found James in our group. So James makes uh, at that time he had made some tutorials and uh, and other kinds of things about LEDs for Adafruit, which makes hobbyist electronics. And they found basically some of James's work, and they emailed they emailed his boss at Adafruit, who then sent James that message, and then that was that was kind of how it ended up happening is the white house found james's boss and then james's boss sent it to us so what what i've got from this is that you have two people to thank for your career taylor swift and obama yeah that's actually true i probably i would not have uh i would not have quit my job and actually like gone down the insane journey of attempting to be full-time at my own thing if if it weren't for that pivotal moment even though it didn't ever happen like even though we literally never built anything there I wouldn't have quit my job if, if I didn't, if someone didn't ask us to do it. Yeah. Right. So what was the next big project? Sorry, you're just yeah, about yeah. to get so, to that. Yeah. So after all that little stuff trickled in, the next big project that, that really came in was, um, was, uh, we actually had two at the same time. One was a project we did with Google and the other one was we made an LED video bra for Katy Perry. So two, two really different projects. One, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So, this was like this was like twelve or fourteen months into into um, into Smooth Tech existing, and uh, we had um, we got contacted by the lighting designer of uh, the Taylor Swift tour, who basically just sent us a message saying, "I have a project that's just as crazy as as this thing did for Taylor Swift," and he's like, "I'm working on it, same produ- same producer." like let's get you guys in on this and we were like yes like finally like something is happening (laughs) and we (laughs) were sitting in the back of your head at all like oh my god not this again like again yeah kind of because i'm always i'm such a perfectionist and one of the things that i'm always like so afraid of is like one of these things just not working on stage because like we're putting we're putting this stuff like on people that are like actively wearing it in front of like twenty thousand plus uh people on a tour and you just want it to work perfectly and it is scary because what i do like i still do this like every night of the show i'll go to like instagram and i'll be like hashtag Katy perry and i'll just be like did it work tonight and i try to find like the video for wearing it <laughs> like <on. laughs> and you know what one night i think it was at like mohegan sun in connecticut uh the bra didn't work and it didn't. it didn't well one side worked it was it was two sides and uh and one of the sides didn't work and she played it off perfectly and that actually like removed a bunch of that fear because the bra was like a big reveal she like threw off this coat and it was right before she does hot and cold and the bra flashes hot cold like on it like back and forth and uh right and like the whole left side of the bra just like didn't say anything on it but so it just, said, it just said yeah well it said it said half of the word hot <laughs> <laughs> and uh <laughs> but she like played it off she was just like she i mean it was incredible uh because it actually took like so much pressure off i mean the pressure is still there you always want everything to work perfectly every time but it was also like 
I couldn't be more thankful that she was wearing it at that moment and was able to just like make a joke about how her boobs weren't working that night. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming from there, just kind of springboarded then into yeah, and then with another a bunch of little breaks because I remember when you got mm-hmm. married, you built randomly an arcade yeah. machine, definitely for a card game, arcade game rather for your wedding, and then that ended up on the <laughs> right, news. right. And so everything just kind of, this is when I, because, you know, we've been friends for years, but this is when I even started to kind of notice that you, your kind of company was starting to get way bigger than even I realized it was. Yeah, at the time. yeah. And it was, you know, it was strange because, like, as we, as we started doing more of these things, we started to get press and started to, like, take interviews and started to, um, like, actually, like, be able to, like, Google my name and see something come up. And that was a whole, a whole strange environment, too. I mean, it's like, by no means what like an actual famous person experiences but at the same time it's like it's like whoa there's like a news article with my name on it from billboard that's crazy and and that another big yeah and it's like and that that kind of stuff kind of kept happening with projects and like um now we've found ourselves in time magazine and and uh l and vogue and uh in style and it's 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 kind of it's kind of crazy and well, you recently worked on the VMAs that just yeah, happened, yeah. right? We made a um, we made a LED face mask for Lady Gaga that she wore through her whole um, her whole performance uh, during uh, she did like she did a bunch of the songs from her new Chromatica album, and uh, we made an LED face mask that kind of mimics the art style, like the sign the sinusoidal uh, wave art style in Chromatica, and uh, yeah, she wore it for the whole performance, and it like we didn't actually know that she was gonna wear it for the whole performance. And it kind of like just blew our minds because she spent like twelve minutes on the VMAs on this like crazy like iconic night where she won like everything, and she was like wearing our mask during her big performance. But at the same time, nobody knows that's you that did it, it right? I mean, it's people seeing it like it's just a mask. Nobody knows. Yeah, and it's it's strange, you know. That's that's one of the other weird parts. It's like when you always like want the credit, you always want people to like know that it's like yeah, we did that, but. You also have to figure out how to be tasteful about it. You know, you don't necessarily want like Lady Gaga to like go up to a microphone and be like, "Smooth technology made me a mask." But at the same right. time, when people when people Google it later, you do want them to know. And and that's actually what. Well, a lot of it's probably the people behind the scenes too, like the people who put that together know yeah. who made that, and that's probably ninety. Definitely, that's of like ninety percent of our business. But you know, you still you still want people just to know what you're doing and one thing that i think everybody will know you for is and you're gonna know it the minute i say it is oh, the yeah. hat the the billy porter hat <laughs> absolutely <laughs> that was amazing now you said that wasn't that like just a side project that you guys kind of yeah did it was something? a really it was a really quick project we have um there's this amazing hat designer that we work with um named sarah sokol and she had she like had this concept for this like light shade hat and then we were like we came up with like the idea of like how it would open and stuff and it was just this crazy collaboration that happened over the course of like a couple days and and then you know we just kind of made this little system where uh billy's stylist (laughs) could basically walk behind him and press a button that would open his hat for him and press another button that would close it so billy could just stand there and like look awesome while the hat did its thing and uh and (laughs) we never expected the amount of media attention that it got. I mean, it, it went out there. We thought it was funny and hilarious and like just a really cool little project that, that we worked on with our friend. And then next thing we know, it's getting reshared like 20 million times on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does your company look like now? It started off as the three of you. What is it now? What is the, how many people are there now? I mean, what is the you shape know, of it we now? We stay, we stayed very small. we, we had um we had five people at the uh at the beginning of this year and one of um our uh, our senior manager Mia was really awesome and she actually she actually left to take on her own career in like social media and stuff. She's really great. And then um and then Sachem is uh is the other the other person in our business. So really there's four core members. It's me, uh it's me, James DeVito, Dave Scheinkoff, and Sachem Marvinson. And Sachem, Sachem, we met him on Taylor uh, while working on the Taylor Swift stuff, but he came in full time with us a little bit later. 
he actually was the um was the touring and uh the touring light guy lighting person and um and kind of like a major like creative creative person with uh you know with like all the lighting and visuals for the flaming lips for the last like 11 years right. and so he um he's added so much but basically like you know we keep this small team because we all work really well together we design really well together but you know when it comes to making some of these huge projects with a lot of a lot of fabrication we we expand like massively i think we we probably at one point last year had something like 30 people hired on for uh for like a for like a month to to build uh to build like some of our big projects so we we kind of we kind of grow and shrink but we kind of we keep our team to this just our main designers like the main group of uh the core group of us that all that do a lot of the design and engineering because we're just we have a very good chemistry with each other now i got a question that you could probably answer pretty quickly because i assume mm-hmm. i knew the answer is there ever been a project that you have turned down have you ever said no that is literally not possible or anything like that i've never said it's not possible but i have turned down projects <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah we've you know it's it's funny because when you're new like when we were when we were young we never turned on anything everything was a yes because you just you want to get something but you know i feel like like last year we really started to hit our stride and we actually turned down a lot um because you know we don't really want to change our dynamic we love being a tiny a tiny weird company with just a bunch of strange people that enjoy making bizarre electronics and and so we we kind of uh we could have had more work last year and we just we we didn't take it and that's honestly i think been for the best we we keep our workload how we like it and uh and it lets us put special attention and special creativity and you know kind of our full selves into every project so there is one thing though that the kind of obvious question now that what's going on this year is how has covid affected oh, everything yeah. Like what has it done to you guys? COVID is a nightmare. Honestly, it's it's bad for us. Uh, we've been able to like one thing that we're really lucky about is that with our tiny team, we are super agile, so we can we can kind of change what we do pretty rapidly if we need to. And you know, I'll say that that like last year, uh, last year at this time, like this far into the year, we were. We, we had already done tons of projects, like tons and tons of projects. And this year, we've probably done like four projects, realistically. But that said, we did manage to kind of pivot into the medical industry briefly. Um, so like right when, uh, right when everything kind of shut down in March, um, we were like, oh my God, we work with live entertainment. Like we, we work with, with stage shows we make experiences like did you ever think it was all i mean it felt like it might be it definitely felt like it might be it was it was pretty dire for for a moment there but then i got a call from from an old friend who's actually the he's the president of nanotronics the company that i worked at and quit um about five years ago to start smooth technology and uh and he said he was you know he was interested in working together on a uh, non-invasive ventilation device and next thing i know me and the whole team we rev up and we say all right this is this is what we're doing we're going to work on we're going to work on medical devices and uh you know we worked we worked with them and uh as of june we actually we made a device that got fda approval and is actively in production um well we made the device with them with nanotronics and uh, it's an active production to be, uh, you know, to actually be used to help uh, to help COVID, you know, people who have COVID and uh, and other kind of respiratory problems, and and unreal, man. Thanks, Seriously, man. it was it was crazy. It was a really a really really weird. Uh, you know, this year has been extremely strange, and it's it it definitely felt at points like like man, like I'm gonna just have to uh, figure out how to just survive for (laughs) for the rest of the year but then but then yeah that that rolled in and then you know as of about a month ago i'd say the whole entertainment industry is starting to just accept that coronavirus is here and so 
things are starting to happen. So what's the forecast look for you then? I mean, without these events, what are you going to yeah, do you now? Know, we're going to work on things that are in the virtual space. So one, one example is Lady Gaga's VMA's performance that was a televised performance and we can, and we're, we're planning to keep working on those kinds of things. And, um, and we also have, uh, we also have a lot of ideas in the realm of, um, of kind of, uh, like different types of like toys and lane devices to help connect people while they're, uh, while they're away from each other. And, uh, and one thing that we're also doing, um, which is actually in the realm of experience, but, uh, it kind of, it predated COVID and we've, and, Hopefully we'll open sometime in the next couple of months. I mean, we'll we'll see. It's gonna be, it's gonna definitely be after a COVID vaccine, I think. But uh, we're doing a, um, we're kind of making working on this big. We're directing all of the uh, technology at a at a new art museum in Texas called Seismic, and that's mm-hmm. that's been a that's been a huge project. So it's kind of like for this year, we somehow we just we just skated by and somehow. Manchester survive by becoming a medical company for a few months. <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> with FDA approval, which I assume the ha- well, that was probably the hardest part. Oh, FDA yeah, absolutely. Approval. Yeah, it was uh, working with um, John from Neutronics and just kind of, uh, you know, figuring out figuring out all the ways to engineer around all the all of the requirements of the FDA so that this thing could actually actually be used and help people. And that was, yeah, it's definitely a hard part. It's they do not give away that approval easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was very noble of you. It's honestly pretty amazing that you guys have been Thanks, able man. to do that. It's, it's, and it's been a really good time at the same time. It's, you know, even though it's a different kind of work than, than what we're used to, uh, I love being able to, to dip our toes into a whole different, a whole different field. And, you know, right. it kind of just made sense this year. It was like, it's like, right. what I felt was the, like the right way for us to use our skills this year all things considered. All right. So let's, let's end on a, uh, on a pretty happy note, you know, yeah. the best we can, because I know I was going to ask you about, you know, your job searching experience and all that, but you never really had that. But what do you think? Like, what is your thoughts on the, just real quick, just a couple minutes so we can wrap it up. Just the, uh, your thoughts of today and what's it like, you know, getting a job for people nowadays and things like that. You're kind of self-made, yeah. but I mean, what um, are your thoughts? You know? Yeah. I, I personally got really, I, I, I luckily was able to, uh, make a business and kind of just follow my internship from college through. I feel like I I took a lot of the easy way out earlier on. Um, but finding that internship, um, and finding, and also just from a lot of my friends who are looking for jobs right now, it seems really hard, especially during COVID. Um, I mean, at this, at this point in time, uh, just no one is hiring basically. So, <laughs> right, it's a real it's a problem. problem. Um, but you know, at the same time, I kind of have a feeling that once we have a vaccine and can kind of, um, you know, start to start to actually, uh, you know, learn to learn to live with coronavirus as we all <laughs> as we all get vaccinated or you know do whatever kinds of um whatever kinds of uh uh you know social distancing and masking up and all that kind of all that kind of good stuff that we're all they're all doing already i think that um i think that things are going to kind of round a corner because i think there's there's so much creativity and innovation that's happening in the home right now while everyone's unemployed that i i think that i think that there could be some kind of new little renaissance of uh you know of, of innovation that's that's just around the corner and i think that that could create a lot of that jobs. would be fantastic I think it would be it? fantastic and honestly <laughs> i think it's there i mean i feel like covid created this this whole uh this like in the like the hacker community that i often like operate in um everyone after after everyone lost their jobs from coronavirus they uh they all started to work on medicine and all started to like make databases and contact tracers and all this kind of stuff. All this innovation occurred so rapidly. And it's like this kind of disaster seems to breed innovation. And I think that there could actually be some positive, some positive things on the end of the end of this, uh, coronavirus time period that might actually make jobs. Well, if there's anybody easier. to, uh, 
If there's anybody who knows how to pull something out of nothing, that's you. That is absolutely <laughs> true. But uh, thank you for your time with this and uh, talking to me. I have a million more questions, but I don't have enough time today. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll talk to you again. You know, I'd like maybe you can uh, be on with the poll show awesome, with I'd me love and to. that, and uh, you can uh, BS with us a little bit. I know you'd love that. But so, um, give your uh, company a little plug yeah. too. Um, so yeah, we're called a uh, you know look up Smooth Technology. Uh, Instagram is uh, Smooth Dot Technology. You can see all of our weird different inventions. You'll see everything from random LED LED dresses and masks that we make to things like pneumatic punching gloves and uh, chairs that'll make you bounce around with the remote control. We're, we're always just looking <laughs> to do the next weird Amazing. thing. So, yeah, check us out. All right. And, uh, yeah, like I said, we'll probably see you on a, on a podcast in the future. We'll have you on a yeah, podcast. Why not, awesome. right? <laughs> all right. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Paul.